Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. From August of 2006 to May of 2007, the Jackson Public School District of Jackson, Mississippi, had a really difficult year. It seemed like nothing could go right for them. They fired a middle school principal for alleged financial misconduct. Then that fired middle school principal turned around and accused the superintendent of sexual harassment. A high school teacher was arrested for possessing a jaw-dropping amount of cocaine. And an elementary school teacher was convicted of killing her husband. I can only imagine the rumor mills during this time. Students probably whispered to each other, was it your teacher arrested for cocaine? Or was yours convicted of murder? The Jackson community probably thought nothing could make that school year any stranger. But they were wrong. And that's because within the same academic school year, two Jackson public school teachers were caught having an extramarital affair. A male science teacher and a female language arts teacher. Then, in a shocking turn of events, one of those teachers was convicted of murdering an expecting mother. And the other fled the state. Welcome to episode 183, The Brutal Murder of Avis Banks. Late November in Mississippi isn't like autumn in the North or even other parts of the South. The weather is only starting to feel crisp, with the days in the high 50s and 60s and the lows at night in the 40s. But the leaves have already changed, so if you want to see the gorgeous colors of autumn in Mississippi, you need to visit in late October to early November. In this part of the South, Friday nights are for football and Saturday mornings are for raking leaves. On a Wednesday, the week after Thanksgiving in 2006, it was one of those perfect days when the temperature had risen to the 70s that day, and by dusk, there still wasn't much of a chill in the air. A young, expectant mother named Avis had gotten off of work and was headed home. In her fifth month, Avis was tired. She had called her fiancé, Keon, who was a teacher and basketball coach, to see what he wanted to do for dinner. Since he was at basketball practice late and Avis was tired, he said he would pick up some takeout dinner for the couple when practice ended. Avis pulled her car in the driveway and used the automatic garage door opener to get in the house. She stayed in her car until the door went down like she always did, to make sure she was home safe. But as soon as she stepped out of her car, she was shocked from gunshot blasts. It happened so fast that Avis was found with her keys still in her hand. She may have never even known who shot her, but they knew her. Avis Marie Banks was born on August 18, 1979, to parents Deborah and Frederick of Vicksburg, Mississippi. She also had two sisters. Vicksburg was and is a small town on the western border of Mississippi. It has a population of about 20,000 people, and it also has a ton of Civil War museums and landmarks, which makes sense. Back in July of 1863, two years before the end of the Civil War, Vicksburg was the site of a crucial battle. Whoever controlled Vicksburg controlled the Mississippi River, And that was important. The Mississippi River was a key asset for transportation and supply reasons. The Union and Confederacy fought for several days. 37,000 lives were lost. Eventually, the Union won, which was a big deal. With this victory at Vicksburg, the Union might have ended the entire Civil War. Lincoln even wrote a letter to a general indicating as much. All they had to do was take out General Robert E. Lee's army at the Potomac River in Maryland that same month. But Lee's army escaped, and the war went on for two more years. But let's get out of the 1860s and move back into the 1980s and 90s, because Vicksburg isn't just a Civil War town. It's also where a young Miss Avis Banks grew up. Avis was a quiet, soft-spoken, and gentle young woman the textbook definition of an introvert. She kept to herself and preferred staying in to going out. But when she did socialize, people remembered her as being kind and sweet. The one thing everyone knew about her 
Avis loved children. In 1997, she graduated from Warren Central High School in Vicksburg. Then she went 45 miles south to attend Alcorn State University in Claiborne County, Mississippi. There, she earned her bachelor's degree in early childhood development in 2002. Avis hoped to launch her own daycare one day. Her father, Frederick Banks, told the Clarion Ledger that he and Avis had even looked at a few potential daycare buildings together. But she needed more time before committing to a lease. In 2004, 25-year-old Avis was living in her hometown of Vicksburg, Mississippi, when she met 29-year-old Keon Pittman. They crossed paths while working out at their gym. Avis was immediately smitten with Keon. He was confident, charming, handsome, and he knew all the right things to say. Plus, Keon and Avis had a lot in common. Keon had also attended Alcorn State University. And he, like Avis, loved kids. He had gotten his bachelor's degree in education. Keon and Avis felt like a match made in heaven two like-minded individuals who would devote themselves to improving children's lives. A year after Avis and Keon began dating in 2005, Keon got a new job. He was to be the sixth grade science teacher and basketball coach at Chastain Middle School. It was 47 miles east of Vicksburg in Jackson, Mississippi. So Keon and Avis, who were still going strong, moved to Jackson together. They got an apartment, they found a church, and Avis was hired at a local child care called Bright Horizon Daycare. Avis and Keon looked like they were doing really well. Her new daycare loved her. Her boss told the Clarion Ledger that she was a wonderful employee. And Keon was having a great time teaching and coaching at Chastain Middle School. And, to help with money, Keon had taken a part-time job as a bartender at the local Mexican restaurant. In Avis's parents' eyes, this was a green flag a sign that Keon would do whatever it took to make sure that Avis was financially secure. Her father, Frederick Banks, told Snapped he was a very good provider. So in June of 2006, when Avis became pregnant, it might have felt a little bit like fate rather than an accident. Sure, Avis and Keon weren't planning for a baby, but they would have gotten there eventually, right? Maybe this was just one of life's little blessings happening a bit earlier than expected. But Avis's parents struggled to see it that way. They were Christian folk who didn't want their grandchild to be born out of wedlock. Avis's dad said that she was going to make it right by marrying Keon. And so, Keon and Avis became engaged. They planned their wedding for January of 2007. Their new child would be born sometime around March that year. It wasn't quite a shotgun wedding, but it was close. And as a result, Avis's parents were pretty worried that Keon was going to get cold feet. Her mother, Deborah Banks, told Snapped, We knew that Avis wanted to be married to him, but I don't think he really, really wanted to be married yet. Regardless, it seemed like her parents' concerns might have been misplaced. After all, Keon was excited to be a husband and father. He was thrilled when they found out that Avis was having a little boy. And he was even more excited to help pick out his unborn son's new name, Keelan. Keon was adamant that he didn't want to raise his child in an apartment, so he and Avis bought a nice house in Ridgeland, which is a suburb of Jackson. It was only a 20-minute drive from Chastain where he worked. On Wednesday, November 29th of 2006, Keon and Avis had been dating for over two years. Their wedding was two months away and both of them were very busy. For Keon, the fall semester was winding down. With winter break just around the corner, the kids were getting squirrely in the classroom. As for Avis, she was five months pregnant and planning a wedding. Plus, Thanksgiving was the week before. And Avis's parents had come over that Sunday to help her put up Christmas decorations. So, on this particular Wednesday, Avis was exhausted. The Thanksgiving holiday had worn her out. They had traveled to Houston, Texas for Thanksgiving Day and then back to Picayune, Mississippi that weekend for another family get-together. And she had worked late that day. She was just then heading home at 5.15 p.m. On the way, Avis called Keon. 
He was also going to be home late because he had to coach the boys' basketball practice. During this conversation, Avis and Keon decided they weren't up to cooking dinner that night. Keon promised he would grab some food on the way home, but he couldn't talk to Avis for long. Basketball practice was starting. At about 5.45 p.m., Avis pulled her late model Honda Accord into her driveway and grabbed the mail, just like normal. Her house was lit up with Christmas lights. Then she opened the garage and parked inside it, just like normal. She turned off the car and used the remote to close the garage door. As an extra safety precaution and the final part of her coming home routine, Avis waited to get out of her vehicle until the garage door was completely shut, just like normal. But when Avis got out of her car, she was ambushed. Her attacker shot her four times with a handgun. The first bullet hit Avis's thigh, incapacitating her. Then, three additional shots were unloaded into Avis's body at close range. The final shot was delivered execution style to the back of Avis's head. She never had a chance to defend herself. Even though the unknown attacker had shot Avis Banks four times, they weren't done yet. Next, they pulled out a knife and stabbed her body numerous times. The last wound was a vicious slash across Avis's throat. Then, they left. Avis's body went undiscovered for three hours. At 8.45 p.m., Keon came home from basketball practice, and that's when he opened the garage door to a nightmarish scene straight out of a horror film. When 31-year-old Keon Pittman walked into his garage at 8.45 that night, he probably couldn't believe his eyes. His fiance, who was also the mother of his unborn child, 27-year-old Avis Banks, had been murdered, and it was brutal. Avis lay in a pool of blood on the garage floor next to her Honda. She was wearing her work scrubs and a jacket. Her car keys were still clutched in her hand. Scattered on the floor around her arms and purse was the mail she had just retrieved from the mailbox. Keon, who was undoubtedly in shock, said he ran to Avis's body and shook her, trying to rouse her. Frantic, he said he kissed Avis's cold lips. And then he pulled out his cell phone, but he didn't call 911. Instead, he called a coworker from Chastain Middle School. A 25-year-old cheerleading coach and language arts teacher named Carla Hughes. When Keon called, Carla was already on the phone with her mother, Linda. Carla had called her mom after finishing up with her evening jog at around 8.30 p.m. Now, she was cooling down and chit-chatting with Linda. Carla put Linda on hold because Keon was calling her. When Carla spoke to Keon, he explained everything, and he asked Carla to come over. Carla switched back to the line with her mother and relayed the situation to her. Linda was immediately confused. Why was Keon calling Carla? Why did he want Carla to go to his house? A murder scene? Was he out of his mind? What Keon needed to do, Linda told her daughter, was call the police. She told Carla not to go to Keon's house. Carla switched to Keon's phone line and told him to call the police. But strangely, Keon still didn't call 911. After ending the call with Carla, Keon ran to his next door neighbor's house. A married couple lived there, and they were shocked to hear Keon screaming at their front door. By the time he started banging on their front door, the married couple had already called 911. Not for Avis, but because some strange man had lost his mind on their doorstep. In the recorded 911 call, you can hear the situation unfold. Keon's female neighbor tells the 911 operator that someone is trying to break into her home. Meanwhile, her husband goes to see what's going on with Keon. After some muffled conversation between the husband and Keon, you can hear the husband yell, Somebody killed his wife. And then the wife says to the dispatcher, Oh my God, he said somebody done killed his wife. Minutes later, the police arrived at Keon's home. Officers found him holding Avis's limp body. Right away, the emergency responders separated Keon from Avis and declared her dead. And then his home was searched. As the investigators looked through Keon's home, they realized that it had been robbed. 
or at least it looked like it had been robbed. There were two clear footprints on the back door where someone had kicked it in. And the place was a mess. Items were pulled out from drawers. Electronic devices had been unplugged and strategically stacked as if someone was getting ready to carry them out. But nothing was actually stolen. Anything worth stealing remained in Keon and Avis's home. And the crime itself didn't look like Avis had walked in on a robbery. For one thing, Avis hadn't even opened the door to her home. Her keys were still in her hand. She had no idea there was a robbery taking place. Whoever was in her home had plenty of time to escape unseen. Also, her pants were pulled down as if to indicate she was possibly sexually assaulted. But the autopsy would prove that was false. And the police still believed that the way Avis was murdered didn't feel like a robbery. Whoever killed her had overdone it. Four shots, multiple stabs, and a slash across the throat. This felt like rage, not like some random criminal trying to make a quick buck. Investigators suspected that the killer had a personal motive for wanting Avis Banks dead. Detectives concluded that this burglary was staged to cover up the murder of Avis, and their first suspect for the killer was Keon. After all, his clothes were covered in blood when the officers arrived, and the shoe prints on the back door were the same size as Keon's feet, a men's size eight. Additionally, the officers also thought it was odd that Keon, who always parked outside and walked into the house through the front door, had opened the garage door that night. But Keon had also called Avis on his way home. When she didn't pick up, Keon was already a little worried. Perhaps he had no idea what was in the garage. He just decided to open the door to see if Avis's car was there since she didn't answer his call. Or perhaps Keon opened the garage because he already knew what he would find. And another mark against Keon was the whole, why didn't he call 911 question? He had his phone on him and he had called a coworker. What stopped him from getting help in the most efficient way possible? Calling 911 is almost a knee-jerk reaction for most people in an emergency. And if they don't call 911, a close family member makes more sense for someone in shock, not someone you work with. The police weren't sure that Keon was telling the whole truth. That same night, they took him to the station for questioning. As he waited in the video-recorded interrogation room, he went through a range of emotions. Sometimes he was sad, at other times he was angry. When he called a lawyer on his cell phone, he said, these motherfuckers think I had something to do with this shit. Frank Dillard, the Ridgeland detective who questioned Keon, remembered that sometimes Keon would laugh or tell jokes as if he didn't realize the seriousness of the situation, as if he didn't really mind that his fiance Avis and their unborn baby were gone. I'm not telling you this to sway you against Keon, I'm telling you this so you understand why the police were suspicious of him. Everyone is going to grieve in their own way, but the police can only go off of what they have. And right now, what the police department had was Keon, a rather unconcerned man who had not called 911 for his fatally wounded fiance and his unborn child. And investigating the person who finds the dead body is normal, standard operating procedure. Additionally, it gave the police an opportunity to ask Keon questions. That way he could be cleared as a suspect. When the police asked Keon why he didn't call 911 himself, he said he wasn't sure where his phone call was going to be routed. He said he was worried that, since his phone was purchased in a different city, he would contact emergency responders who were too far away. The detectives were not convinced by this answer. And frankly, that's not how calling 911 works. But maybe Keon didn't know that. Next, the officers asked him where he was that afternoon and evening. He said he had taught at Chastain Middle School during the day, and then after school, he had run some errands. He had picked up groceries and then dropped them off, but not at his and Avis's house. He had dropped them off at Carla Hughes's apartment, the same 25-year-old cheerleading coach and teacher from Chastain Middle School that Keon called instead of the police. According to Keon, he needed to get back to the school building for basketball practice. He didn't have time to go home and put the groceries in his own house and return to school. 
so he had temporarily stored them at Carla's place. Her apartment was closer to Chastain Middle School. And if you're wondering, the logistics of this do check out. Carla's apartment was closer to the school than Keon's house, and her place was in between the grocery store and Chastain Middle School. Then, Keon explained to the officers that he went to basketball practice. Practice was over at about 7.30 p.m. After that, he went to Carla's to grab the groceries. He spent some time there, and then he went home, and that's when he found Avis's body. As you can imagine, this interview didn't make the police feel confident about Keon's innocence. They dubbed him a person of interest. But after they did gunshot residue testing on his hands and confiscated his bloody clothing and shoes, they did let Keon leave the station without making an arrest. While the police were waiting for Keon's test results and clothing analysis, they continued to look into him. They visited the Mexican restaurant where he moonlighted as a bartender. There, they spoke to his co-workers, and his co-workers had a lot to say. Apparently, Keon was well-known as a womanizing player. He liked women, and he wasn't shy about it. According to Keon's restaurant colleagues, he was cheating on Avis with several different women. These women would stop by the restaurant when he was bartending. They would order drinks, flirt, and sometimes even kiss Keon. And one of the most recent women was none other than Carla Hughes. Now, investigators had heard Carla's name twice. Once when Keon stored groceries at her apartment, and again from Keon's co-workers. It was time for the police officers to actually speak with Carla herself. On December 1st, the officers went to Chastain Middle School to interview Carla. Right away, she was crying. When asked why she was so affected, Carla said she was upset about her close friend's fiancé's murder. When Detective Frank Dillard asked Carla directly if she had a relationship with Keon, she denied it. According to his interviews with Snapped, Carla said, without a doubt, they were not romantically involved. Obviously, they were absolutely romantically involved. But Carla wouldn't admit it until the police asked her to go to the station that afternoon after school. And even then, she would need some cajoling before admitting the truth. All throughout the second police interview, Carla kept reiterating, he's not a boyfriend, he's just a friend who's a guy, nothing sexual with him. She insisted that Avis knew who she was and knew about her and Keon's friendship. Carla said that Avis had even heard her and Keon chatting on the phone on multiple occasions. But when Detective Dillard sternly asked, were you two romantically involved? Don't lie to me about this. Carla changed her story. She said yes, she had been sexually involved with Keon. But now, Carla added, it wasn't serious. She said it was not a full-blown romantic love affair. And she said specifically that she'd never, ever want Keon to leave Avis for her. Their relationship hadn't been serious like that. It was, according to Carla, just sex. During the second round of questioning, Carla also explained where she was on November 29th. When school got out and the students were dismissed, she and Keon chatted for a bit. They nailed down the details of how he was going to get the groceries, drop them at her apartment, and pick them up after basketball practice. Then, Keon went to go run his errands. He put the groceries in Carla's apartment around 5.15 p.m., and then his practice started at 5.30 p.m. and went on till 7.30. So at 7.35 p.m., Keon went to Carla's place to pick up the groceries. According to Carla, Keon stayed for around 45 minutes and then left at about 8.30 p.m. Once Carla had established a timeline, one thing became abundantly clear. For the time that Avis was murdered, from 5.45 p.m. to 6 p.m., Carla did not have an alibi. Following these interviews, both Keon and Carla were considered suspicious by the police working on Avis's case. They even wondered if Keon and Carla had committed Avis's murder together. As the detectives searched for more clues, they began looking in earnest for the murder weapons, a gun and a knife. Although they didn't have any leads on the knife yet, the police were able to narrow down the kind of gun the murderer had used. Based on the crime scene, the detectives knew they were looking for a five-shot revolver. There had been four shots in Avis's body, 
and one stray bullet had gone through the garage door. So whoever shot the gun had emptied it of bullets. And whoever shot the gun had also had the forethought to pick up the shell casings off the ground. In a stroke of good luck for the police, a man reached out to them regarding Avis's case. His name was Patrick Nash, and he was Carla Hughes's cousin. And Patrick told the police that Carla had recently borrowed a gun from his personal collection. She had wanted it for protection. Her neighborhood was a notoriously unsafe area. Someone had even tried to break into her place recently. So three days before Avis was killed on Sunday, November 26th, Patrick gave Carla his 38 caliber five-shot revolver, as well as a three-inch hunting knife. When Patrick handed over the gun to Carla, it was loaded. But when Carla returned the gun on December 1st, two days after Avis's murder, it was empty. And Carla did not return the knife. Carla Ann Hughes was born in July of 1981. When she was very young, she was adopted by Carl and Linda Hughes. Both Carl and Linda were teachers in Greenville, Mississippi. They were prominent figures who were well-respected in their community. They went to church on Sundays. They were friends with the mayor. Everyone liked them. And so, of course, everyone liked their adopted daughter, Carla. In fact, the small town of Greenville loved Carla. She was a bit of a rising star. She was beautiful, popular, and well-liked. She competed in beauty pageants at the state and regional levels. She was a cheerleader, musician, dancer, honor student, and an award-winning equestrian. Carla's friends remarked that she was always trying to better herself, and she was voted most likely to succeed in the 1999 graduating class of T.L. Weston High School. After high school, Carla attended the University of Southern Mississippi. There, she completed her bachelor's degree in education. And at about the same time, Carla was in a long-term relationship with a man. She and this man were engaged to be married, but he backed out only a few days before their wedding. He called the whole thing off, and Carla, now newly single, was pregnant with his child. When Carla's mother, Linda, spoke to Snapped, she said, The father backing out of the situation was kind of disappointing, but we sucked it up like we always do when problems occur and we moved on. Linda wasn't concerned about Carla being a single mom. She knew that Carla's tenacity and perseverance would pull through. If anyone could raise a child on their own, it was Carla. And not long after all this, Carla gave birth to a baby boy. After that, Carla went to Bellhaven College for her master's degree in education. Then she started teaching kindergarten in Greenville around 2004. To no one's surprise, teaching went really well for Carla. She was great at it. A friend of hers said all the kids loved her, whether they were in her classroom or not. But Carla didn't stop there. She was determined for greatness. She enrolled at Delta State University and began studying for her education specialist degree. In case you don't know what that is, that's one of the highest academic achievements available for teachers. In the summer of 2006, Carla took a new teaching job in Jackson, Mississippi. She was going to work at Chastain Middle School, the same school where Keon Pittman worked. This career move wasn't a demotion for Carla. Nothing had gone wrong at her kindergarten position in Greenville or anything. Carla was just ready for a new challenge and better pay. And at Chastain Middle School, Carla could be a lead teacher. And they had also offered her a position as a cheerleading coach, which was extra money. Carla was elated. But since she was hired right before school started in August, she had to scramble to prepare for her new job. Carla's parents were happy to help their daughter out. They took care of her son while she found a place to live in Jackson, and that freed Carla up to look at a broader range of apartments. But since Carla couldn't be picky about her new place on such short notice, she accidentally rented an apartment in a rough neighborhood. Carla's mother said, I was concerned about the safety, but school was about to start and she had to have somewhere to live. In early October, only three months after Carla moved in, someone tried to break into her apartment. The perpetrator wasn't successful, but Carla was still spooked. She began looking for a new place to live. But between teaching, parenting, and life in general, 
the apartment hunting process was slow going. But other parts of Carla's life were looking up. For instance, her new job was going very well. She loved working at Chastain Middle School, and her colleagues loved her too. One colleague in particular liked Carla a lot, and that was, of course, sixth grade science teacher Keon Pittman. Carla and Keon met in August of 2006 when the Chastain Middle School year began. The two teachers bonded quickly, and soon after they connected at Chastain, Carla began hanging out at the Mexican restaurant where Keon worked part-time. They would speak for hours and hours about school, about home, and about life. As Keon and Carla's friendship grew, they began spending more and more time together. Once, Keon even visited Carla's family in Greenville. It wasn't a long visit. Her dad, Carl, remembered that he only spoke to Keon for about two minutes, just enough time for Carla to introduce her friend before they skedaddled. We're not sure exactly the date when Carla and Keon's relationship became sexual, but Carla indicated that it was fairly early on. They would have sex two or three times a week, and they weren't exactly careful about hiding it. The two lovers were definitely caught up in their passionate affair. On three occasions, Keon and Carla waited until Avis wasn't home, and then they had sex in Avis's house. And that wasn't the only time Keon and Carla risked exposing their affair. They passed each other love notes in school, using students to ferry the messages down the hallways. They spoke to each other during the school day. They called each other almost daily, and they texted constantly. According to Keon, Carla would tell her friends that he was her future husband. Keep in mind, Carla was fully aware that Keon was engaged to another woman. But for whatever reason, that didn't seem to bother her. I don't place 100% of the blame on Carla for that. You never know what line of BS Keon was feeding her about his relationship with Avis. Meanwhile, Avis had no idea about Carla. She thought Carla was merely one of Keon's many co-workers. Avis and Carla only ever met in passing once or twice. Occasionally, Keon would be on the phone with Carla in Avis's presence, but as far as we can tell, Avis never witnessed anything between Keon and Carla that would make her suspicious. And if you find yourself judging Avis just a little thinking, how could she not know? I would encourage you to stop. Avis loved Keon. He was her actual future husband, the father of her child. She trusted him. And you'd be surprised what you can get away with when someone trusts you. As the police looked deeper and deeper into Carla, they became more and more suspicious of her motives. Sure, she had said the relationship between her and Keon was just sex, but was she telling the truth? Was she more enamored with Keon than she had let on? Could she have wanted Avis dead? The police knew they couldn't trust Carla, especially since she had lied to them about the nature of her and Keon's relationship, saying it wasn't romantic when it definitely was. And then there was the second lie that Carla had told. Because she hadn't just lied about her relationship with Keon, she had also lied about having access to a gun. During Carla's second police interview, when she had finally admitted to the affair with Keon, she had also told the police she didn't own a gun. When they prompted Carla again, asking if she had access to a firearm, she said no, she most certainly did not. She even went on to explain that her father had many guns, but she didn't. But as we know, Carla was lying. She had had her cousin's gun during the time when Avis was murdered, and she had his hunting knife too. And when she returned the five-shot revolver to her cousin after Avis was killed, the previously loaded gun was now empty. Carla told her cousin that she had done some target practice. That's why the bullets were gone. But the cousin had gone to the police anyway. Thank God for people who do the right thing, regardless of who it might implicate. Later, in court, it would come to light that when Carla's family approached her and asked, hey, was Cousin Patrick's gun involved in Avis's murder? Carla allegedly just looked down and shrugged. The police took Carla's cousin's gun for testing. Then on Wednesday, December 6th, they asked Carla to come down to the station for additional questions. This would be her third round of police interviews. And this time, Carla brought a lawyer. She could see the writing on the wall. This wasn't going to go well. And it didn't. That same day, 
Carla was arrested for being an accessory to Avis Banks' murder. On December 7th of 2006, the day after Carla was arrested, the police searched her home. They were looking for the missing shell casings, the knife her cousin gave her, blood-stained clothing or gloves, shoes matching the print at the crime scene, and any correspondence between her and Keon that would help establish their ongoing relationship. During the search, detectives didn't find the knife, but they did find a pair of shoes that matched the two shoe prints on Avis's back door. They were Carla's women's size 10 black tennis shoes from a brand called Tread Safe. They were the kind of heavy-duty, non-slip, thick-soled shoes a waitress might be required to wear in the service industry. Remember, the police had thought the shoe prints on the back door were Keon's, and that's because Carla and Keon had the exact same shoe size. A women's size 10 is the same thing as a men's size 8. But even though the shoe prints turned out to be Carla's, not Keon's, the police still thought Keon was involved. Actually, so far, the police had only charged Carla as an accessory to the murder because they believed Keon was the mastermind behind Avis's murder. They figured Keon wasn't ready to settle down and had wanted a way out of his marriage and impending fatherhood with Avis. Law enforcement officers hoped that now that Carla was facing an arrest, charges, and jail time, she might turn on Keon in exchange for a deal. But Carla didn't. In fact, she refused to speak with police at all. And Keon wasn't talking either. His lawyer advised him not to go into the precinct anymore. Instead, the lawyer wanted the detectives to give Keon pre-written questions. Then, Keon would answer them, presumably while his lawyer helped guide him. But the Ridgeland police didn't like that. They wanted to speak to Keon in person, not through written answers filtered by his lawyer's advice. If you're a longtime true crime fan, you've probably seen this pissing match before. Defense lawyers and cops don't get along. They aren't supposed to. And nothing productive ever comes from this ongoing feud. By the time everything was said and done, Keon never spoke to the police again. And therefore, the police didn't get any definitive answers about Keon's involvement or lack thereof in Avis's murder. The Ridgeland police named Keon as a suspect, but not because they had him dead to rights or anything. They were pissed that they couldn't interview Keon on their terms anymore, and they more than likely named him, hoping to shake things up, either with Keon or with Carla. The same day that Carla went for her third police interview, December 6th, 2006, Avis Marie Banks was laid to rest at the Locust Grove Missionary Baptist Church Cemetery in Vicksburg. She was survived by her parents, sisters, cousins, and many friends and family who were all devastated by her loss. They wanted answers, and their suspicions were on Keon. At Avis's funeral, the family's anger at Keon was simmered to a boil when they noticed he didn't seem to be crying or grieving. Avis's parents told Dateline that her older sister believed a woman might have killed Avis, a woman that Keon was fooling around with. The sister became enraged and was about to go after Keon physically, but was stopped by another family member. Other folks in Avis's family grew angry, and the scene became so heated that the police who were on hand had to escort Keon out of the funeral home with a coat over his head. Two days after Avis was buried, on December 8, 2006, the police charged Carla Hughes with two counts of capital murder, one for Avis Banks and one for her unborn son. In the state of Mississippi, a five-month-old fetus is considered a human being in murder cases. Carla was held without bail at the Madison County Detention Center. Once again, the police weren't sold that Carla had actually committed this crime by herself. They hoped that these charges would incentivize Carla to flip on Keon. The police even told Carla's attorney as much. But still, Carla would not implicate Keon. She remained silent. Carla's friends, family, and hometown community were shocked by these developments. Carla had killed a pregnant woman, our Carla. There must be a mistake. Multiple people spoke to journalists from local newspapers expressing their disbelief that Carla, the all-American girl they had all known and loved, would do such a thing. 
One person told the Clarion Ledger, the Carla Hughes that I know is an upstanding, professional, intelligent, caring, dependable, and respectable friend. Another friend of Carla's said, I hold her in very high regard. And another said, I have never seen Carla act aggressively or even raise her voice for that matter. Carla's Greenville Church, a congregation of over 200 people, also stood behind her. The pastor, Jean Fowler, said, she was very smart, energetic, motivated, a great role model for the other young people. The mayor of Greenville and about 60 additional Greenville residents wrote letters to the judge in Carla's case. They wanted Carla to be granted bond so she could stay out of jail before her trial. But the judge refused. It wasn't out of spite or anything. In Mississippi, a person charged with capital murder almost never receives a bond. And Carla had been charged with capital murder twice. She was most certainly going to sit in jail until her trial. The students and parents of Chastain Middle School were also shocked by this horrendous scandal. They didn't know what to make of any of it. Two teachers caught in an extramarital love affair, a wife and mother-to-be dead. One parent told the Clarion Ledger, it's just sad on both sides. The kids kind of knew before it got out and they're just kind of confused. They look up to teachers as role models. Carla had resigned from her Chastain Middle School teaching and coaching positions in early December of 2006, probably when she was first arrested. It's unclear if Keon was fired from Chastain Middle School, but he was recommended for termination that same December, and it appears that he never returned to teach there following Avis's death. The general public was also flabbergasted. Ridgeland was a nice neighborhood, not one where people feared break-ins, staged robberies, shootings, and stabbings. Ridgeland's last homicide had occurred over a year earlier, and the public was especially horrified that Carla, a mother herself, was accused of murdering an expecting mother. January of 2007, the month when Avis and Keon were set to be married, came and went. In February of 2007, Keon sold his and Avis's Ridgeland home. He moved to Michigan. And less than a year later, in December of 2007, Keon married a different woman from Detroit. And in July of 2007, Carla was formally indicted. And in October of 2009, now 28-year-old Carla Hughes's trial began. If you're like, whoa, that's three whole years after the murder, you're right, it is. It's not clear why Carla's trial took so long to get started. Her lawyer, Johnny Walls, tried to do some legal sidestepping on Carla's behalf, but most defense attorneys don't want to delay trial. By filing for a speedy trial, they're making sure their client doesn't sit behind bars for too long. And also, it's often strategy, giving the state less time to prepare, particularly in murder trials. But evidently, the police never stopped trying to get a confession out of Carla. On Valentine's Day of 2008, they sent her a copy of Keon's marriage license to the woman in Michigan. Per Dateline, she said she wasn't surprised. Her attorney wanted Carla's case to be thrown out because, quote, Carla was a descendant of slaves and experienced overt and cruel discrimination in Mississippi on the basis of race. But this argument did not hold up in court. Also, Ridgeland switched district attorneys in the midst of Carla's legal proceedings. I imagine that also slowed the process down. But still, justice delayed is very painful for victims' families. Finally, on October 5th of 2009, Carla's trial began. The DA was seeking the death penalty due to the particularly vicious nature of Avis's murder. And her family publicly supported this decision. The state argued that Carla killed Avis out of jealousy. She wanted Avis out of the picture so she could be with Keon. The prosecution claimed that Carla and Keon's relationship wasn't just sex, as Carla had previously told the police. In fact, the prosecution believed it was the exact opposite. Carla was madly in love with Keon, but he didn't feel the same way about her. And Keon, who testified for the prosecution, agreed with this assessment of their relationship. Keon told the court that Carla was furious 
that he wouldn't leave Avis for her. According to Keon, he and Carla had once had a pregnancy scare, and he said when Carla thought she was pregnant, she really pressured Keon to leave Avis, but he wouldn't. Keon's refusal to choose Carla made her so mad, allegedly, that she started driving to Keon and Avis's house. If Keon wasn't going to tell Avis about their affair, then Carla would do it herself. Keon testified that the only thing that stopped Carla from exposing their relationship was that he threatened to call the police on her. I'm assuming because she was stalking the couple. And yet, he didn't end it with Carla, which might have diffused the situation. Keon also testified that there were other moments when Carla was frustrated by his commitment to Avis. For example, the week before Avis was murdered, Keon and Avis traveled to see family in Picayune, Mississippi for Thanksgiving, the Saturday after Thanksgiving. And then Keon and Carla met up at a Picayune hotel. According to Keon, Carla begged him to stay at the hotel with her for longer and longer, but he couldn't stay too late because he was in town to see family. Carla allegedly was put out by this and their date ended poorly. The next day, Carla told Keon that, quote, from this point on, some things are going to change. Then she borrowed her cousin's gun and hunting knife. And four days later, Avis was dead. The prosecution proposed that Carla had snapped, completely lost it. The prosecution insinuated that perhaps Carla's previous failed engagement back when her fiancé and father of her child left her just days before their wedding, had made Keon's consistent rejection especially hurtful. And they painted Keon as a sympathetic, grieving widower. He had a box of tissues with him while on the stand and everything. Which, ugh, this freaking guy. Obviously, I am with Avis's family and have a really hard time finding sympathy for him. When Keon was asked, why did you call Carla after finding Avis's body? He responded, because I was looking for anyone to come. At that point, I didn't care. I just wanted someone there. And when asked if Keon ever intended to leave Avis for Carla, he said no. Carla wasn't long-term. His relationship with her was, quote, sexual, caught up in the moment. He was also asked if he killed Avis, to which he, of course, said no but he did say that he felt partially responsible for Avis's death. The prosecution also proved that Carla's cousin's gun was the murder weapon. Ballistics experts testified and confirmed it with forensic testing, and an independent crime lab had found trace amounts of Avis's blood on the sole of Carla's tread-safe shoes, the same shoes that matched the shoe prints on Avis's kicked-in back door. In response, Carla's attorney tried to suggest that Carla wasn't Avis's killer, Keon was. He suggested that Keon had gotten into Carla's apartment with a key he already had, taken Carla's cousin's gun, put on Carla's shoes, traveled to his own home, kicked in his own back door, staged a robbery, killed Avis, and then framed Carla. This guy should write for the movies. But to support this, he pointed out that Carla's hands hadn't had any gun residue on them while Keon's had. Mind you, it was a negligible amount, a single particle of gun residue on each of Keon's hands. An expert testified that Keon easily could have gotten it from touching Avis's body, and we know that he was cradling her when the police arrived. And Carla's hands would not have been tested the day that Avis was killed, so this is a stupid, moot argument. But Carla's defense wasn't done. He also cast doubt on Keon's alibi claiming that Chastain Middle School was near enough to his and Avis's home that he could have slipped out of basketball practice, killed her, and returned without anyone ever noticing. But that didn't hold up either, and for good reason. Keon's cell phone records placed him definitively, without a doubt, at the boys' basketball practice during the time of Avis's murder. And we are 100% certain that Keon attended the entire basketball practice without sneaking off to kill Avis because he was hitting on one of the player's mothers the whole time. Keon and this basketball mom were texting across the gym. They couldn't speak out loud to each other because they wanted to hide their flirtatious conversation from any onlookers. After all, Keon was supposed to be engaged. Jesus, this guy. And this mother, 
while she wanted to hide her conversations with Keon because she was married. In the months after Avis's death, Keon would go on to have a sexual relationship with this married mother. But regardless of his shitty actions, he had an airtight alibi. He was at basketball practice when Carla killed Avis. That's all there is to it. There is still a chance that Keon colluded with Carla to kill Avis. If you'll recall, Keon did know to open the garage when he got home. Usually, he would have just walked through the front door. And Carla did call Keon at 5.30 p.m. and again at 6.05 p.m., the exact window of time when Avis would have been killed. Perhaps Carla was discussing the murder plans with Keon. We'll never know. After all, Carla couldn't accuse Keon of colluding with her without admitting she killed Avis. If this was true, I can only imagine Carla's silent, simmering anger at trial when she couldn't implicate Keon. The detectives in Avis's case told Dateline they still believed Keon Pittman may have been an accomplice, but he never talked and neither did Carla. What we do know is that when Carla called Keon at 5.30 p.m. and at 6.05 p.m., her phone pinged a cell tower less than half a mile from Keon and Avis's house, placing her near the scene of the crime at the precise time the crime would have happened. At the end of the day, Keon never faced any charges, and he walked away from this entire ordeal scot-free. On October 12th, the defense rested their case. Carla did not testify in her own defense. And on October 13th, 2009, after deliberating for over eight hours, a Madison County jury found 28-year-old Carla Hughes guilty of murdering Avis Banks and Avis Banks's unborn child. Upon hearing the news, Carla burst into tears. Avis's family was also emotional, but for different reasons. Avis's mother felt justice had been served and her father told the Clarion Ledger, Avis can finally rest in peace. The next day, Carla was sentenced to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. The jury had been uncomfortable recommending the death penalty for Carla since she was the mother of a five-year-old boy. Today, Carla Hughes is serving her two life sentences at the Central Mississippi Women's Correctional Facility in Pearl, Mississippi. She was denied a new trial in 2010. She appealed that decision in 2012, but was denied. Carla's parents raised her son. Her mother, Linda, continues to assert Carla's innocence. Keon, as I mentioned, moved to Michigan and married a woman from there. I would hope that he learned his lesson about cheating, but seeing as he kept up sexual relationships right after Avis's murder, I doubt it. Cheaters typically don't stop being cheaters. And if he was involved in Avis's murder, hopefully one day he will face judgment, in this life or the next. As for Carla, I understand the jury's decision and respect it. John Dryden wrote, Jealousy is the jaundice of the soul. Avis Banks is now resting in peace. But I wonder if Carla Hughes is even capable of finding peace. Southern Fried True Crime is hosted and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by Andrea Marshbank, with additional writing by myself, and of course, all editorial opinions are my own. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. Today's episode was edited and mixed by Brandon Sheck Snyder of Southern Gothic and Erica Kelly. Thank you to Danita, Melissa, and others for suggesting today's case. If you have any case suggestions, please go to my website and click on the listener suggestion tab or email sftcresearch at gmail.com. You'll get lost in a sea of emails if you send it to my main address. So this is the best way for me to get those little known cases y'all always send me. Please remember that I do not accept suggestions on social media private messages. With three platforms to manage, that is very overwhelming for me. I hope you understand. But please come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. 
I much prefer spending my social media time in our lovely group. We do, of course, discuss true crime, not just Southern fraud, but all kinds, but it is still very much a Southern lifestyle group. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on all large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, Spotify, and now Amazon, Audible, and YouTube. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.